Hey, Cash. Uh, hey, you guys. I apologize for my tardiness. Oh, no, that's not on you. I think we flip-flopped some links back and forth, too. Yeah, yeah, but, but I found you. We, we, we found each other in this, this virtual global world we live in. Something. Yeah, this is nuts. Where are you at? Okay, so uh, I am currently on the move. I'm currently in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, um, where I, I arrived from Mexico yesterday, um, where I've been... Uh, I've been down working on a creative project, which I'll talk about a little later, uh, hopefully. And um, okay. yeah, but I'm currently in Phoenix, Arizona, celebrating my, my mom's birthday. Okay, man, you, yeah. you're a busy guy. Okay, so I'm gonna, informal, um, what, we, what we'd like to do if you have the time is do a quick intro here and then uh, we'll lay, sort of lay the ground flicks, conflict reporting, talk a little bit about your career. And then towards the end here for a few minutes, we'll have everybody be able to do a q and A. I've got the like the list of folks. We've only got four or five folks because um, we're going to throw it up on YouTube after. And so Great. we'll have them kind of do a raise hand thing and do a q and A. Are you good with that? That was outstanding. Okay. And can you hear me all right? I know I'm all kind of juggling wires and things. <laughs> I'm the I'm the one who uh, you know decided to take it all outdoors. So the the real question is, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're good. We're good. All right. I'm let's standing. Jump, let's jump straight into it. Okay. So, hello, everybody. My name is John Seward. I am the outreach coordinator and awards coordinator for MBJ. I work closely with uh, Zach and Russell on a lot of our different projects. I was able to work with them on our top vets this year. When we have one of them with us, Kaz Larson. Uh, thanks also to Amber, who's kind of doing our background for us. Amber is with the JPAC group, which does a lot of our background support and helps us work through all of these things. And she's also the uh, programs assistant for MG MBJ. So thank you, Amber. And introduce the main man. We've got Navy SEAL Kaj Larson. He's a Harvard grad. He's a journalist. He's a producer. He's an entrepreneur. He's, I'd say, a scholar. Uh, he's definitely an athlete. So, Kaj, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I do not feel worthy of that introduction, but it is much appreciated. So tonight we wanted to sort of dive into conflict reporting. Um, obviously, a lot of our members, our membership base is all veterans. And from my understanding, that's kind of where you got your start in journalism after grad school. Is that accurate? It, it, pretty close. Um, you know, I guess, well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you, everybody, for joining. It's, it's a real honor to, to talk about this. If there's two topics that I'm passionate about, um, it's, it's veterans issues, specifically around the veteran service space, um, and also journalism. So these are, uh, this is an amalgam, a mashup, if you will, of two topics that I, I care really deeply about. Uh, and I thought that um, I might start with an anecdote from grad school. Mm -hmm. um, is that when I was in grad school, I was a, uh, and we can talk about my nonlinear path, you know, whenever, if it's instructive to other people. Um, but I had a professor there who ran um, a school that was attached to the Kennedy School of Government where, where I had matriculated. Uh, and the, the, this particular institution was the Shorenstein Center for Press Politics and Public Policy. And it was run by a guy named Alex Jones, uh, not probably the other Alex Jones in journalism who you might be thinking of, um, but the Harvard professorial Alex Jones. And, and he had written this definitive history of the New York Times. Um, and so that was his one of his claim to fame. He had been a long time New York Times correspondent turned sort of media, public intellectual. And he told me this story um, about journalism is that he used to go to the annual publishers conference every year. And, and he was, uh, for per, there's no ageism here, but for purposes of understanding the story, uh, Alex was was a very older, very senior professor. He was an old guy. He had been around <laughs> doing reporting since the 50s, right? Gotcha. So a real a real gray hair, right? And and he had been going to this same annual newspaper publishers conference for like 40 years, starting in the 50s. And what he said is that in the 50s, um, they would open up the conference every year by parading these, the flags, the service flags, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, down the center of the aisle. And anybody who had served in 
uh, the armed forces would, they'd ask them to please rise as they paraded the colors down the, the center aisle of the conference, right? Uh, and I know what everybody's thinking, like you can't quite imagine this happening today, right? Uh, but so they'd parade the flags down and he said in those days in the 50s, because it was post-World War II, um, and it was a very male dominated profession, like 90 percent. And even the women in the room had served in, in some capacity. Um, you know, I'm here with my grandmother who was in the Navy in World War Two. Right, uh, right. th so basically, essentially, 90 percent of the room would stand up. He went to that same conference um, when I was in in graduate school. He was still attending it, which is circa 2005. And they paraded the colors down that tradition had held. But what had changed is that not a single person in the room stood up to represent their particular service. Um, and that was because there is such a dearth of military expertise in the field of journalism or military knowledge or, or military service in the field of journalism. Um, and that's why I'm so excited to be part of MBJ, to be talking to everybody on this call, because I actually think that that like real experience um, having served in uniform is an essential, valuable contribution to the field of journalism. So, yeah, that's why I think this conversation is important. Awesome. No, thanks. That's a that's a heck of an anecdote. I mean, especially from someone that obviously has quite a bit of history in the field to see sort of the change over time. That's that's absolutely flabbergasting. Right. So, I wanted to start with sort of where you started in more like TV documentary and the Vice News. I think a lot of, I think a lot of folks, when they look up your background, those are some of the first things that, that come to mind. And yeah, some of those almost like journalist notebook type interviews that you did because of conflict reporting. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I'll try and keep it as contained as possible, but essentially when I, got off of active duty in 2005. That was my last year of active duty service. There's a whole nother chapter. I spent a lot of time in the reserves, which I was doing concurrently with journalism with people who are interested in, in how I navigated that, that line. I'm more than happy to talk about it. But for simplicity purposes, I got off of active duty in 2005. I was on my way to graduate school. Um, I got out, I ended my active duty service in June. I was matriculating at Harvard Kennedy in September. And my plan was to go back to my hometown of Santa Cruz and surf and chill out after a bunch of deployments. Um, and then what happened at the time to show you just how haphazard and sort of serendipitous like this whole start of a career fork was, is that I had a friend who was working at Current TV, which at the time it was Al Gore's TV network um, that they had that they were starting up, but they hadn't even launched, right? And they needed a correspondent to go to what they thought was Iraq, um, but uh, they wanted, and they didn't have anyone who was willing to go. They, right. you know, had a bunch of, you know, and this is remember before YouTube had launched or YouTube had just launched, right? The digital streaming idea, the short form content um, hadn't really taken root, right? So 2005. Um, I had a friend who was the assistant to the assistant of the president of programming at the network, which essentially means like you got sushi for the president of the network. Right. He, he's like, you gotta, you gotta talk to this guy, Kaj. I think he'd be great. Uh, not only had I never been on camera or produced, um, any video before, uh, I had never even had a TV to be honest. Like I, my, I'm from Santa Cruz. My parents are self-described counterculture. I grew up without a TV. So I was. <laughs> so fish out of water in this thing. <laughs> um, but through, by hook and by crook, they reluctantly like sort of accepted me because, sorry about that background noise. Oh, uh, nice. They uh, they reluctantly accepted me because they didn't really have another correspondent who was willing to go. And they were launching in September and they needed a bunch of content. Uh, so I went to Afghanistan, back to Afghanistan. I convinced them that Afghanistan was a more important story than Iraq. Um, I went back to Afghanistan this time you know, jokingly, I say, traded a, a gun for a camera. Um, and right. then I, uh, and then I, I proceeded to do a 13 part sort of micro doc series there. I had a producer, which was kind of an old salty dog CNN guy who shot for me. He brought along a, uh, I don't know what you call them, an actual typewriter as opposed to a keyboard to write scripts <laughs> on, to show you kind of how old school he okay. was. 
Um, and in some ways that was kind of my, my first mentorship, but I, so I go to Afghanistan over the summer, I produce and host this 13 part series along with this, this, this old school kind of crotchety CNN producer who, who does like, he does help me, right? Like I couldn't have done it without him. I, I literally had no idea about the filmmaking part. Right. Um, but I was mostly just kind of leaning on my experience of having, you know, like embedding with soldiers, having walked a mile in their shoes, like picking up ideas in the ether while I was boots on the ground of things that I thought would be interesting. The The series was a hit it, or a hit in the sense that they launched um, the the network with that in that September and they were sort of short on content at that time and it became kind of, you know, right time, right place. They played the hell out of that series. Um, then they offered me a position at the end and I said, no, no, I'm on my way to graduate school, but I continued to do reporting for them throughout graduate school. So that okay. Christmas, I found myself back in Afghanistan. I did spring break Cambodia, summer in Somalia. Um, and then I'll take like a brief pause. Sorry, I'll return to what else I did that summer because I think it's really germane to where a lot of my inspiration uh, comes from for a lot of the, the ideas I come. But the, the short story is that I continued to work uh, for Current TV throughout graduate school producing these documentaries whenever I had spare time. Uh, it helped me earn a little bit of money. When I finished graduate school, I took a full-time position with them. I was then recruited by CNN, poached by CNN, and I was, uh, did the same kind of work for CNN during a period where they're doing some more experimental stuff. That CNN circa 2011, vastly different than the, the all politics all the time CNN, yeah. you know, fo foil to Fox News kind of stuff that, that you see now. Um, F after CNN, I took a, a brief hiatus, went back on active duty, did a mobilization, um, and then did some stuff kind of off brand for a while, more on the producing side behind the camera stuff. I produced that series lock up for MSNBC. Right. Um, and then uh, and then I went to, to Vice after that uh, and and was a host and producer for the, the HBO show, which was kind of the flagship product for Vice. Uh, then I left Vice and I uh, worked for a digital outlet called Now This News, which probably some of you guys are familiar with. I, it's kind of like, I call it faux gras journalism. It's like force fed into your like Facebook yeah, feed. Yeah, short, and short and bites Instagram. and it's everywhere. And it's just stuffed down your, your, your feed, <laughs> right? Um, and so I, I was there and then concurrently with that position, I sold an original uh, documentary series that I had created and was the executive producer of to Netflix. Uh, so now I'm deeply in, uh, and that was called the business of drugs. And that was the last major media project I did before the, the current endeavor that I'm working on. So the short story is current TV, the short story long is current TV to CNN to vice on HBO uh, to Netflix. Well, and if, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm hearing in there is like a crap ton of hustle and like going to whatever location anybody asks you to go to. And if I track my dates right, the time from like the current to CNN is like just grinding it out for like six to eight years. Is that about right? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. You know, with with grad school thrown in there and, you know, at the risk of being too abstract in general, like for sure, I'm like a shark. I got to keep swimming or I'll die. Right. <laughs> like I, I do. But I, I also think that that comes from my military experience, right? Like one of the things yeah. that's lost in this conversation we have about veterans transition and how our, our military skills translate into the civilian world is that veterans have like a pretty extraordinary, um, they don't consider themselves entrepreneurial, but they are inherently <laughs> entrepreneurial, right? And like, I've seen yeah. this over and over again, like across both the special operations community, but also on the conventional side, it's like, Hey, you don't have like armor on these Humvees, like yeah, figure, figure it out. the fuck out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, definitely like sort of the that soft skill of being able to just take ownership of something and push it forward. Yeah, and that's hard to communicate to like employers. It's certainly hard to communicate to editors and newsroom people. But I would say like that I'm always attracted to veterans and like more specifically veteran journalists because like more often than not they're gonna have like this deep sense of like, do, do you guys, is message to Garcia a, a term oh, that people are familiar it's with? Oh, still, yeah, still okay. definitely. Okay, all right, yeah. They just got that message to Garcia, like drive to mission accomplishment. Yeah, no, that's, 
That's awesome. It's, it's interesting to hear you point it out from the perspective of having been in the industry for a while and having both that entrepreneur side of it and the journalism side of it, because like you said, I think it's a difficult thing for a lot of veterans to communicate to an employer. Hey, I'm, how, how'd you say it? I, I'm a shark. I have to keep swimming, swimming. Yeah. Right? Or I yeah. die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But just like that, that drive, right. That ownership. So no, that's, that's awesome. Um, I want to get into the, the conflict reporting a little bit, uh, yeah. especially since like, just to give it a little focus. When you started bouncing around, like I mentioned, it sounds like you just kind of said, hey, if, if you need somebody to go somewhere, I'm your guy. What was at sort of the first level, your mindset of keeping yourself safe as you sort of bounced through different environments, may or may not have, you know, a fixer to be able to help sort things out? How did that go? Yeah, well, I, I guess on the conflict, uh, I mean, uh, to put a finer point on what you said, very rarely, um, with the exception of that initial current TV uh, experience, was it always a case of like, hey, we want to send you to this place, right? I would say even within institutions, 95% of what I do has to be self-generated, right? Because if we just look at like the media space writ large, right? Like, foreign corresponding and conflict corresponding are such an infinitesimal like part of the overall news experience that I always find that, you know, if you choose to go in this domain, just understand that you're going to be running uphill to get attention for your stories and ideas. Right. So I would say 95% of my stuff is self-generated as opposed to being assigned to something. Um, and my career, if anything, is finding these few outlets that were committed to sort of original, sometimes long form, investigative, conflicty, foreign, overseas stories. There's gotcha. this perception out there that international stories don't do as well. I think this is true on both the, the, the TV and the editorial side. Mm -hmm. um, there's just, and you're going to have to fight that stigma your entire career, right? It's a lot easier to do, you know, I'm a, I'm a TV guy primarily. It's a lot easier to do like bad reality permutations, you know, pit bulls and paroles. So it's right. a lot yeah. easier to do the 17th iteration of that than it is to be able to convince someone that it's worth it to send you to Mogadishu um, because this conflict is so critical, right? So, um, so as, yeah. so, so with the, Fair enough. With it being self-generated, did that sort of play into your decision making of, I know that this place is going to have this level of safety versus a different spot having, uh, you know, a, a, an entirely yeah. different conflict environment? Super fair question. Uh, I am probably like one of the worst people to talk to about safety and like risk matrix calculations because <laughs> my scale is is off, right? I, I would say a, 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 a way to think about it that is more uh, maybe pragmatic is not like what my personal risk calculus is. Although, even though people don't think I make a personal risk calculus, I constantly assessing risk. And like one of the advantages of us all being veterans that are in this field, I, I think again, generally speaking is that we have a situational awareness about dangerous situations, um, that can hopefully keep us safe. The biggest impediment for me, especially now that I've moved into higher end TV production, like Netflix series and stuff like that is not my personal risk tolerance, but the risk tolerance of insurance companies and figuring out even within news organizations, how you're going to be able to communicate risk tolerance or risk mitigation to insurance companies, because like you can have the world's best idea to parachute in to the middle of Syria right now right and take <laughs> right. on the, the the wagner group you know like after uh you know a wingsuit like entry from a, a, a c-130 at thirty thousand feet right just total but, like, hollywood insurance. right into the middle of news yeah, but <laughs> exactly but like like it, the insurance companies will will shut that down and so then it you know this is if you're working within institutions obviously as an independent journalist you can do whatever you want. Um, my personal risk calculus, my personal risk mitigation techniques, I, I guess I would wrap around a couple of different accesses. One of them is just my own experience over time in war zones, both in uniform and as a journalist. Uh, the, the second thing um, that I would say is that like we rely on local experts and we 
we do this in the service too, right? Like we don't go out and hit houses without like translators and, um, you know, and, and we almost always have like a local guide, a fixer, right? right? Yeah. Um, and, and so I, we lean so heavily. I know the term fixers has fallen out of vogue. We, we and I lean super heavily on local producers in order to make this kind of stuff happen. So those, those are my, my major things. And, you know, like, uh, then there's like the really tactical stuff, which, you know, I know we've all, uh, all thought about, but like, you know, do you wear body armor? Or do you not wear body armor? Right. Like yeah. there are times that you, you know, I, I think of it the same way I thought about it when I was running a platoon, it's, it's big boy rules, right? Like sometimes <laughs> yeah, exactly. some, yeah, sometimes, and look, there's a credible argument to be made on the tactical side that, you know, sometimes it's better to be mobile and light that question incidentally is less relevant to me in front of the camera as a correspondent than it is to a, like a shooter to uh sorry cameraman right like right. Um, because they have no, exactly those guys have zero situational awareness they're like locked into this this telescope perspective um and so you also have to think about the risk calculus not only for yourself but for your 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 small team as well well that's actually where i was going to kind of take it next was as you've gone into bigger productions how has some of the like understanding of risk the risk mitigation and the way that you approach an environment that you know is dangerous changed because of it being a larger team yeah well my first principle is that i i try and right size productions um to keep the team as as small as possible um even for the last netflix series where we, we shot in 17 countries and uh, I think we were in at least four or five what you know we'd call non-permissive environments or hostile environments. Right. Uh, even for that, the team was just uh, host, producer, associate producer, two camera and sound. So you're still talking, you know, six to seven people. And you know, one of the ways to so keep still, so safe, still team sized rather than like blowing it up. Exactly. So one of the ways to, to keep safe is frankly, to keep your footprint small. If you can keep your footprint small across, you know, if you can get all in a, in a, uh, in a minivan, super ideal. Once, you know, as everybody on this call probably knows, like once you start doing multiple vehicles and you're in like convoy ops, right? Like all of a sudden, like everything starts to scale up. So if you can keep your initial team lean and mean, I think that's actually like one of the risk mitigation places. The other thing, that has been kind of a learning experience for me is that, you know, we often by insurance purposes are required to contract out, you know, what's essentially like a, a PMC, like a, a bodyguard. Right. Um, and those come in all different flavors. Right. And you work with institutions to pick the, the right service. Even at CNN, we have this, right. There's companies, they're usually right. kind of old British SAS guys who are like contracted to go out with the teams, right? And those guys are of incredibly variable quality. What I would say is if you sell a production, you have to deploy overseas with your team, insurance requires that you have one of these guys, figure out how to get the best one of those guys, um, and then also figure out how to use them to your advantage. Like what can they add value to the production in terms of having, I, also, you have to check your ego at, at the door. I at least have to check my ego at the door. I'm like, why do I need some, you know, 60 year old ex <laughs> SAS guy? I'm a frog man. Like, right. I keep yeah. the team safe, right? <laughs> but the truth is, like, in division of labor, you need someone who's, whose sole responsibility is to think about the safety of the team. My, that is not my sole responsibility. My sole responsibility is to think about content and coordination and logistics. And, of course, I have a mind to safety, but it actually, if done right, which is not always the case, is nice to have someone who is exclusively focused on the safety of the team, especially in really dangerous places. So, I mean, if I can, what I'm hearing you say is a little bit just small and simple because that helps with, with the safety. And then on the security side, actually integrating that person, whoever you end up getting, you know, go for the high quality, but whoever they end up being, right. integrating them into the team is going to just be that, that extra layer of, of safety. Yeah, and they can actually be hugely beneficial. So I remember shooting a, a, a doc for uh, HBO in, for Vice HBO in, in Myanmar, where we had to, 
sneak across the uh, the the Thai Burma border, the Thai Burmese border, and then we were embedding with these um, the the KNLA, which is the Karen National Liberation Army. We had a security guy with us. We were we were five days on patrol with these guys. Um, and we had like eh, slightly overweight. Uh, slightly out of shape like sound guy which is I know a cliche but in this case it was true and he <laughs> like the guy drank all of his water in the first hour of the patrol oh no right our sound guy <laughs> yeah so so oh it was insane so me and the uh myself and the security guy ended up humping all of his audio gear for the entire five-day patrol um because like we were strong and, and we could do it. Uh, had we not had that guy, like I honestly have no idea what we would have done. Like, so it was, so the, the audio guy who was like panting the whole time could go slick. Right. So he went slick. We humped all his gear. Um, and it was a lifesaver. Like, you know, so anyways, yes. Integrate them so, in. Exactly. That's interesting. It, I'm kind of skipping ahead here a little bit. Um, but one of the things that, that I've noticed, I'm very junior to the field. And one of the things that I've noticed being still so close to sort of that, you know, that army part of me, um, as an FSO fitness was everything. If you, if you yeah. showed up, if you showed up to the party and you couldn't keep up with the team, it didn't matter what you could call in. And yeah. a, a theme that I'm starting to pick up in journalism is it, it, maybe it shouldn't. And at least socially, it definitely shouldn't, but that on the ground fitness starts to matter too. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, this is, you know, this is, now you're just serving up like, you know, my, <laughs> my favorite, my, my favorite dish, right? Like, I mean, the, uh, we haven't yet started the, the FIJ, the fitness and journalism organization, but it, it should exist out there somewhere. No, like, <laughs> like I, I don't mean to be uh, elitist about it. Like there, there is like extraordinary and important reporting that can be done without that component for the very small particular niche that I occupy. I do think just like being physically fit is an advantage. And I could like bore you all day with stories of like mortars going off and like, you know, moving fast. Like, look, there are just times in conflict journalism that you got to get off the X and you got to get off fucking fast. Um, my first producer in television is a guy named Mitch Koss, kind of an extraordinary guy. He was uh, Lisa Ling's first producer, Anderson Cooper's first producer. Um, and one of the, amazing things about Mitch is no matter where in the world we've been, um, he jogs every morning for an hour. So he's got great video of himself jogging around the square in North Korea. Like he's got great video of himself, like jogging around the Serena hotel. Heck of a Kabul. montage. Yeah. And yeah. So look, I, I don't want to say that it's a requirement for the job, but I, I, look, I'll tell you from, for me personally, I, I have no idea if this is interesting to other people also even overseas like it keeps me sane right like these yeah. are long days like high pressure environments if i can do something sort of physically to kind of clear my head and reset for the day it helps it helps keep a balance for me i want to bring up a little bit of an anecdote because i wonder as as a consumer right and not, like not being there how it played into it there's a scene in one of the business of drugs um episodes where you guys are essentially in the slum and following through Oh, yeah. And I think of like that camera guy, right? I'm, I'm a, I'm a one man band. Most of the time I do environmental stuff. I don't, I don't need the photog. I'm pretty static, but I think of that guy trying to go through and have that shot and maintain that frame the whole time. And I think that's a heavy camera. Like there's a little, there's definitely a fitness component to him doing that. And then also I imagine to the guy watching his six, right. Being able to actually keep up with that like how did that work how did that go yeah well that was that particular scene was shot by fred manu who has won like a gazillion emmys he shot 17 seasons of bourdain's show um and he is like wow. an unbelievable cinematographer he lives six months of the year on the road shooting shows like that and he, he lives the other six months in costa rica with his family where he surfs runs trains uh he's he's Fred's living an extraordinary life and he's really good at his job. I think at the end of the day, the, the synopsis here is nobody ever finished a shoot and was like, damn it, I wish I was in worse shape. 
Yeah. <laughs> right, right. It, um, what you said about sort of being able to de-stress a little bit with, with fitness kind of leads mm -hmm. me to, the, to my next uh, question. One of the things when we talk about conflict reporting, when we talk about being ready to go somewhere to do good journalistic work that we don't tend to talk about is sort of that mental fitness component. And I mm -hmm. wanted to bring up, I know in the military, a lot of us have gone through sort of the training and the thought process and, hey, you need to be resilient. You need to actually think through this. You need to be able to actually balance and concern yourself with how what it is you go through and you see is going to impact you. How have you seen that, not just for yourself, but also for team members that may or may not be veterans that are going with you on these, on these trips? Yeah, look, I, I think this is a crazy fundamentally important question, and I don't think we have great answers for it on both the uniform side or in the civilian world. Uh, I think there is, it, it's really an interesting question about how like we build resiliency from, from some of these experiences. There's, there's a lot of new, interesting data and research coming out that suggests that certain people have certain latent resiliency and that uh, other that perhaps even that you can build and learn resiliency to help inoculate you against some of these circumstances that that you're going to encounter um for me the the probably like one of the harder things to do and um also one of the more critical things to do is to make sure that you're of sound body and sound mind before engaging in any endeavor. And this requires sometimes really like hard and honest assessment. So uh, that same um, that same producer who I was just telling you about, and he would, I don't feel like I'm talking out of school because one, I'm super close with him, but two, he's been super candid and transparent about it. Uh, he, uh, his daughter had uh, childhood leukemia um, at one point. And there was a point that I could tell in our many years of working together when she was going through, she's fine by the way, and she's wonderful and she's she's awesome yeah, and married. It's still to this. a tough thing to I, go through though. Right, right. And like, I remember him, you know, I remember him like coming on shoots with me and talking about how like his daughter couldn't wear sweatpants anymore um, because the elastic would bruise her because she was so frail and weak. And Mitch is a veteran of his many, if not more war zones than myself. But I could also tell that he wasn't like mentally in a place where he could um, forget being a war zone, just like deploy overseas and, and do his best work or even yeah. do his best work in the field. Um, and so like I had to at certain times have to make like hard calls about personnel based on this sort of like, you know, mental fitness idea that, that you're suggesting. Um, and I think that requires sort of radical transparency and then radical honestly, honesty with, with yourself. Um, and, and so for Mitch, I, I, for many, I didn't deploy with him for, I didn't go overseas in the field with him for many years and um, while he was dealing with that, that daughter's situation, even though he was my original mentor in journalism. And I, I just think we all have a responsibility first to ourselves to, to do an honest assessment of that stuff of whether like, this is the right time to, to go in the field. Um, and then we have a responsibility to our teammates. You know, I remember I was in Northern Nigeria um, in, uh, uh, in this, this seventh division, uh, the seventh division of Nigerian army had a camp way out in the hinterland. Uh -huh. um, and I was there covering uh, this, this crisis, this conflict with Boko Haram, which was an insurgent group in, in the North, most right. famous, probably for taking those 300 schoolgirls from a town called Chibuk. So I was there covering them and I was sleeping there with a cameraman who was his first time in a conflict zone. Really good friend of mine, uh, amazing guy, super talented. Uh, and we were getting, and at one night we could, we could hear like the mortar, we could hear the mortars, like indiscriminate fire, like nothing super serious, um, but like his first time being mortared. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I was just, I don't know sure that this story reflects well on me, but I, I remember him like waking me up being like, we're getting mortared, we're getting mortared. And then me kind of like grabbing my body armor and like rolling back over, you know, just using it as a <laughs> and going back Just to having sleep. a chest I, something. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, and, uh, and he left the next day. 
right? And that is that is okay, right? There is nobody. We have so many positive attributes that we bring to both journalism and the civilian world as veterans, and especially as combat veterans. Um, but we there are also perhaps externalities that can be associated with that swim like a shark personality order. And one of those potential externalities is that sometimes like we don't know when to stop and, and, and we can always push and push and push. And for me, I hope this is not too, too general, but for me at least it's important to be cognizant of that, that not only um, can, do I have to be careful about not always just like pushing until things break for myself, but also for my colleagues and my teammates right. and stuff like this. And this was a case where it was healthier to send somebody home than keep them in peril. Just sort of knowing where those lines are and yeah, what, like, I mean, from my perspective, that's part of watching out for your teammate, right? Knowing and understanding where their mental, where, where their mental state is at. Yeah. And, and I'm, I, I suspect like a slightly, you know, older generation of veteran of post nine 11 veteran than, than some of the folks on this call. But, um, I will say like a huge critique of the, the uniform services. We're not good at rec We were not good at recognizing that for the first decade of the conflict. And I, yeah. I do think the military has gotten better about it. So if you're a post 2010, I've noticed that, you know, the, the, the destigmatization of like of, of, of PTSD or PTS or of just mental health in general is a really positive um shift in military right. mindset and yeah. so i'd encourage like those of us who are post 9 11 but like in who fought in that early era like we should take lessons from what's been happening like 2010 and onwards in terms of that awareness and we should carry those lessons into the civilian world if possible yeah no that's great um i, de I definitely am part of like the generation of people that came up through the through the military when mental health was destigmatized and starting to be something that's why I bring it up as mental fitness right I'm right. using lexicons I know right but yeah that that I that idea of actually caring about your teammate and where they're at mentally and where they're at emotionally and I think now I'm talking out of school this is about you but I, th I think there's lines <laughs> there right but I think it's really important what you brought up the idea that you need to have an understanding of where the line is that's too far both for yourself and others and not have that that too much of that shark mentality and push past those lines. Yeah, and and by the way, this is just, you know, scaling back out to a 30,000 foot view. This is some of the value that veterans can bring to the world of journalism and the civilian world. Like I, I promise you, like, like these conversations are not happening within journalism writ large. Like maybe, right. Sebastian Younger is talking about this, right? But like nobody else in the entire media ecosystem is talking about this. So like um, we we have like uh, we we have value that we can add in unique ways based on our unique experiences sure. coming into the profession. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I do want to switch gears on you a little bit. Fire away. There is a distinct. I'll call it a divide, but we're all we're all brothers and sisters in arms, right? Of officer and enlisted, and uh, you were a, you were an officer in the teams, right? Yeah, yeah. Where, where's my cake? Somebody, send it over. <laughs> there, there it is, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, so I want to ask, how has sort of the perspective of being an officer in the military influenced the way that you plan operationally? And if you got to go, I, I, I saw the note there. Great. No, okay, no, I'm cool. good to, no, I'm good to go. My, my, uh, my family was just letting me know where, where the car was parked. So oh, I, am, sweet. I am, I am super good to go. But yeah, um, how, how but, does, excuse me for one oh, second, yeah, yeah. grab a drink. Yeah. Let me grab a, you know, my, my loquacious ways generate a lot of, a lot of thirst. <laughs> no, but yeah, I just want to, how did, how did your background as an officer sort of contribute or hinder you, quite frankly, in planning to be able to do, whether that's the smaller scale or even the larger scale productions you're doing now? Yeah, you know, I don't know that I have like, great insight into it. Um, I think 
especially, you know, in the, the SEAL teams specifically, we're such a flat organization right. horizontally. Like I often felt like I was following, not leading. And like, um, you know, especially some of the senior enlisted are like far and away subject SMEs in terms of, you know, tactics and stuff like that. Right. Um, and so it was sometimes my job just to just to, you know, not shoot anybody in the back and do the paperwork, <laughs> right? Like we're going to the house. Um, so I think probably the more important part, um, but in terms of that, like officer uh, enlisted distinction for me is that, you know, it was the next natural trajectory was to graduate school mm -hmm. and graduate school had a profound influence on my path in journalism and, and my relationships. Um, you know, plenty of enlisted guys and gals are coming out like with degrees already. Um, but in that cadre, especially in that cabal of SEAL officers, almost everybody who gets out is like headed to HBS, Harvard Business School or Wharton or GSB at Stanford. They're, yeah. And we're all, we're all a product of our influences. And my peer group, we're all heading off to I Ivy League graduate school. So in some way, of course, that's what I was going to do. And then when I got to Harvard, um, that set of influences there. And by the way, I think that the, in terms of veterans transition, that the softest landing you can do is, is go back to school. Because one of the things that happens is in the military, we mostly know military people. Um, and then all of a sudden we have like, we get to school and there's all of these other influences on our life. Right. And for me, I, I used all those relationships from, from Harvard in my journalism for the next decade. Right. Like if I was in Pakistan, like I knew, you know, the defense minister in Pakistan, because like he had sat next to me in econometrics, um, you know, and stuff like that. So I <laughs> right. leveraged those relationships like very, very aggressively in for the next decade of my career. I'll, I'll latch on to that, though, because um, Gaffney, Carter Gaffney was one of yes. your, he was one of your teammates, right? And he also went to school with you. Yeah, I mean, Carter Gaffney was like essentially my domestic partner, right? We were roommates <laughs> in the SEAL teams. We were roommates in, in graduate school. Uh, we now co-own a business together, right? It's, it's pretty nonstop. Yeah, well, I wanted to, I wanted to bring him up because uh, we've been talking about sort of the entrepreneurial spirit and some of your early career. And now obviously you're doing much larger projects. One of the things I've noticed for, especially for veterans and trying to sort of break in as journalists is the difficulty of just balancing life expectations, right? I mean, you go from regardless of your, your sort of rank on the, the O or the E scale, you go from a consistent month to month paycheck to trying to find that job in journalism and knocking on a bunch of doors. And I wanted to ask how, well, not how, did your starting a business with Carter help, like sort of support your ability to, to sort of keep pursuing journalism and go after harder assignments? Yeah, I think in general, it would. I think in this case, it actually hurt us because <laughs> un Carter would like lambast us, right? If he was here right now with the story of how the day that I started at Vice News was the day that we opened our brick and mortar fitness facility. So literally, but when we opened, I would teach the 6 a.m., 7 a.m. and 8 a.m. classes. Then I would try and get to Vice by 9 a.m. And then sometimes I'd run over at, at lunch and teach the noon class, work until five or six, and then teach some of the evening classes. And Carter and I were like juggling and balancing all of those responsibilities for the first three months of our opening during the first three months of, of my job at Vice. So I would say um, highly not recommended as a, <laughs> as a technique. Don't like don't do like a, a big job in journalism while starting a business all at the same time. But right. what I what I will say is that because I had great partners, a, a great partner who and our camaraderie and our bond and our trust was formed, um, you know, in 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 fire under duress in the SEAL teams. Yeah. Um, Carter had my back and he would piggyback me during this really hard time with the automatic understanding that at some point 
down the line, the ledger would balance itself, which it did. Right. Um, and so for me, that's, it's kind of a, you know, it's a, I, I never really even thought about it as explicitly as this until, until you asked, but um, it is, I guess the lesson there partially is like you, the value of great partnerships and, um, and, and great people who you can rely on. And sometimes I find this in the civilian world. I don't know if you guys have all had the same experience. It's actually hard to replicate the quality of those friendships and partnerships, or in fact, those pr friendships and partnerships in the civilian world, they might even be easily of equal high quality and of equal value and equal trust, but it's hard to recognize when you haven't done something like go through the crucible of combat together. Right. So one of the challenges in the civilian world is like, you know, someone like Carter, who is, you know, my best friend and who I've been, you know, done all of this hard stuff with, um, in the civilian world, I have these these new partnerships, you know, with new colleagues and stuff, and you don't have that like incredible bond of trust with them, yet you still have to like work together and recognize their value and, and all that stuff. Nice. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't have seen like thought about it in that way and sort of you said call it, you called it balancing the ledger. That's a that's an interesting way to think about it, just having like an right, external that, support. Right, but that only works. Um, if you have incredible faith um, right. in, in your partner, and, yeah, then you're in it for the long haul. No, that, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Part of it, I wanted to ask sort of brass tacks for your early career. Were you, you know, trying to, to think about, man, where's my next job to be able to, to keep the, the, the paycheck rolling? Or was it more... I'm just going to go after the stories that I want. And then I'm, I'm going to maintain sort of this entrepreneurial spirit, you know, take a lot of yeah. risk. How did you yeah, balance I mean, this, sort of the risk with the, with the real world expectations, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is one of the most challenging questions in journalism, right? And, and, and then you can, in some ways reframe it as are you independent or are you attached to an institution? Right. And for the vast majority of my career, I have been attached to institutions and, there are pros and cons to both sides. Um, I do think that there are value. There is value in being attached to institutions um, in terms of uh, one helping amplify whatever whatever work you do, and um, and two in terms of having you know support, whether that's insurance or other people. You know, it's a little different on the editorial side, but certainly on the on the television side. Um, TV is a collaborative team sport and you can't make it without, oh, I, I mean, you can, but it's extremely difficult to scale if you are a complete one man band, you know, um, and to keep the volume up. Um, but I, I guess in general, what I would say is that you kind of want to be comfortable in both worlds because at least for the kind of work that I do, um, right. I spent most of my career chasing places that were willing to invest in what's essentially usually a loss leader for a network, like overseas long form investigative journalism. Like it's, you could sell a one off doc to not to yeah, Netflix. But you're probably going to be in like, the red. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you have to find places that, um, that are willing to say, like, hey, this is going to be the crown jewel of our offering, or we think this is so important that we're willing to not make money on that. You know, Current was one of those places. Um, you know, Vice on HBO was certainly one of those places where they were willing to take a loss because they thought the, the subject mattered. And I would say most of my career has been spent being less strategic and pursuing just the shit that I think is the most important and most interesting, and then hoping that you know, that dovetails with what other people, both bosses, internal audience, and external audience, consumers, <laughs> you know, yeah. think is good. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I want to move on to Q&A because we've yep. got, uh, we had one come up in the chat, but I have a last sort of definitely off the wall question to ask because I heard about it as I was doing research to, for the chat, right? Do you still, is this, is the floating book exchange still a real thing? 
the the floating book exchange might be my greatest contribution to the body of ideas globally. <laughs> right? I'm so proud of that little hand built thing. And like I live on it for people who don't know, which nobody, there's no reason for anyone to know. I live um, in Venice on these canals and I live on the. Oh no, we froze exchange. a little bit. Oh. You, you were saying better? you live in Venice. You live in, you live out in Venice. Yeah, on the corner of these two canals, and I I um I built a uh, a floating book exchange, and like every morning that I wake up and and look out of my living room window, I see people sitting on the little bench in the canal, like reading a book, taking a book, and it brings me. I can't even tell you like what internal pleasure it brings me. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, I I had to ask because I like as I was going through things, I was like, wait, what? It's like yeah. a, a mini barge full of books. This is weird. All right. Um, so Mark M wanted to ask, we had touched on conflict reporting and sort of the way that we delve into things. He wanted to get into a little bit of the reputation risk for journalists. He, he specifically phrased it. Um, when you think about access, how do you balance ethics as a journalist and the need to access uh, exclusive stories? Do you embed with a group accused of human rights? violations or do you just get the or to get the exclusive story or you do you not do you accept access to officials um if they can show you their side etc I, th I think the general yep. idea is there I, yeah i get the gist like amazing question um journalistic ethics sometimes are viewed externally as uh, as an oxymoron um but like i like i at least and since they're not written down anywhere, you know, outside of the annals of, of journalism school, like you're often like navigating and surfing these lines themselves. I guess I'll, I'll say two things. The first is that there are you, depending on the institution that you work for, but um, for more broadly speaking, like some very specific legal parameters around this stuff that everybody should be aware of. And the first is that, you know, you know, in the US, we don't pay sources anyways. I mean, in US journalism, Obviously, Europe does it a little bit differently, um, but like, let's say that like I'm on a shoot with drug dealers in Mexico or South America or something, yeah. and they want you know me to pay for their train tickets, you know, to come to come visit them. This is a real world scenario that's come up multiple times. Uh, I have you're never allowed really to do that with under the US legal umbrella. The jeopardy that you put yourself in is that you risk, I'll forget the act, but you, you know, essentially you could be guilty of providing material support to, to a terrorist organization. Um, and that's just like kind of one legal risk. Um, and they take this shit very seriously. And so now I'll tell an anecdote just to, to say like how I navigate it. This exact question came up um, when I was uh, interviewing some of the Boko Haram commanders um, who had taken some of the Chiba girls. Um, and HBO had actually said that we could not conduct the interview um, for, uh, for all the reasons that we just talked about and because like of reputational risk and like all this stuff. So they basically like ixnade the interview. Oh, and danger, right? Like it was super dangerous, right? So we were supposed to meet these guys at like this secure location. There's no real backup plan um, unknowns. And totally unknown and you can see how like you know uh, it, you know not being in the news business news organizations would be more comfortable with this like an institution like hbo less comfortable uh, ultimately i was able con to convince them not only that it was like okay and that i had mitigated risk enough to make it to make it safe um but that it was important right and while on a personal level of course like i see these guys across from me who in, a, in another capacity I would have been hunting down and I want you know and they're they have it they have the girls like in the jungle you know like yeah. um you know in the Kibera forest a uh, hundred you know miles away or whatever uh while of course personally like I feel animosity towards those guys the way I reconcile it internally within myself is that and I think we all experienced this experience this maybe not in the early part of our military career but as we as we matured more like, yeah, there's, there's bad guys out there for sure. But um, also like, there's a reason that these guys developed to become Boko Haram, which they ended up calling like an ISIS affiliate commanders, right? 
Um, and you know, part of the reason, and I wanted to know why too. And ultimately like these, the value as a journalist in learning uh, from their perspective, I think far outweighs learning and understanding and how to break down the enigma that is something like a Boko Haram commander has far more utility and value to the world in terms of perspective and understanding than not interviewing them. And that's where I, that's where I landed with those guys. I wanted to know how they got to where they were, why they took the girls, you know, um, what, you know, how they justified it, how they rationalized it in, in their, in their mind. Um, yeah. And so that's usually in the end of the day, at the end of the day, I do feel that most people have that were better served from having more information, not less. Right. Of right. course you have to be careful not to like give people, you know, platforms or add weight and value to their opinion, but that's yeah. where, that's where the good journalism, that's where the, like the good storytelling, the good research, the good diligence comes in. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, 51, 49, almost always, you go with giving people an opportunity to present their side of the story. And then you better do a damn good job of making sure that the audience understands the 360 degree perspective. Right. No, that, that, yeah. That's a heck of a question. Nice job, Mark. Um, he tossed us another one and I was actually going to touch on this. I'm going to, I'm going to dig on you a little bit. Dig, um, baby. So he, the way that he spelled it out was he talked about you being a reservist uh, and a journalist and if there was an ethical risk in reporting on military issues while still in the military, he mentioned uh, a person who is in the DC National Guard that's writing stories on the Capitol mission um, and said there's there's an obvious ethical risk there. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, like I said, I wanted to dig on you a little bit. I know that you have another of, uh, you know, a number of other entrepreneurial offshoots won't go into it. Right. But like yeah. there are obviously other ways to, to gain income as a journalist where yep. do you draw those ethical lines? Where do you draw that conflict of interest? Yeah, well, in the, the very short, broad answer is like err on the side of transparency, um, always, right? And disclosure. Uh, that being said, like the example I'm about to tell you doesn't fall into that category. It's actually a case of like where I couldn't disclose because I continued my service as a reservist for so long, that line was often really, really blurry. Where I drew it, for myself is I tried the best I could to draw a, a church and state separation between my reserve service and my, my journalism. Gotcha. Um, one of the ways that I did that was like, I never, ever reported on, on seal issues. I just didn't cover the seal community that also had the added benefit of keeping me in the good graces of my own, uh, of my own community. Um, so the, so while I never reported on the SEAL community, I, I can't pretend that some of the like ideas that I got were not generated from my service. And I think this right. is everybody's own line to navigate. But like one of the first things that I did that put me on the national radar was like I had myself waterboarded. Right. Like I knew about yeah. waterboarding because I had been waterboarded at Sears school. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. And then like here I was as a, a, a MarOps action officer at SOCAF. Right. Special Operations Command Africa. Right. And I was like learning about all this crazy shit that was happening on the African continent, you know. And so, like, of course, that informed like some of my ideas. Um, it, and in, in certain ways, it was the genesis for some of my ideas. But then I would just like leave it at the door, go off, assign research to APs and, and all of that stuff. So it's a great question. I don't have a perfect answer other than to say that, like, um, in the with my other businesses and entrepreneurial endeavors, not super difficult, right? Like they're so far divorced from journalism. Um, with my reserve service, super challenging. I had to keep in a lot of communication with the the public affairs team at SOCOM um, and stuff like that. And you know, it is really one of those tough things. That all of us veterans know. Like, there's the like, well, do I go seek? permission from this large bureaucratic organization to do something that they have no incentive to sign off on or is this a beg for forgiveness right. situation and i'll just you know in all candidness i have played it both ways yeah i mean that seems that seems fair right it's like doing the layout and knowing that you can get that part later on but for today you still take it from your buddy 
Yeah. And like the one thing that I say, like where I would like draw the line is that for me, no story was ever worth the risk to either denigrating um, my, my standing in the SEAL community or like more practically speaking to my security clearance. Right? right. Like I couldn't. So if, if, if I had to err, I erred on uh, a little bit the side of caution. Those were two like serious red lines for me. Um, and, even, and even though they got blurry, you kind of had left and rights of like, obviously no, yeah, knowing but I, that your, that your security clearance was solid. And then also knowing you're still solid with the community. Sort of, but as everybody knows, I don't want to pretend that it was explicit because it's sometimes a little hard to navigate those things. Like, yeah. um, thank you so much. Uh, it, it, you know, so I just, I just did my best to use my best judgment given the circumstances. Um, and I guess maybe the final thing to say is like lean on allies. Um, I had a few allies within the so common within the NSW community who I could socialize ideas with before I had to do a formal ask. So it, it, maybe this is where some of like those like slick talking officer skills come into play, <laughs> right? Like, no, you learn how to socialize concepts so that you get yeah. buy-in before you ask the, the question. Um, I, I, yeah, I would say I utilized that a lot. No, that, that actually, that makes a lot of sense. This, the slick talking, especially, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, rich, one of our, one of our guys, he actually runs our podcast. He threw us a question. What is your experience with the culture advice? I know you're a couple years removed, but he says, it seems like a culture that would be tough for vets to fit into specifically. Oh, I mean, rich, like nailed it. Like I felt so fish out of water at vice like i i wasn't a hipster and i didn't wear a fedora like and <laughs> <laughs> no like no i mean like i'm i'm joking but it's like totally true and i'm not like i don't think i come off like with a high and tight and like you know spit polish boots as like the most ultra military i think i've done like a good job of chameleoning and being able versatile and being able to walk in both worlds right, but right. vice but vice was mind-blowing to me like you know um you know funny fact about kaj is that um you know even though i grew up in santa cruz like i've never done any drugs like i didn't smoke pot you know i was at the naval academy when i was 17 right like i just like i skipped that chapter in my life yeah. and here i show up at a place where well, you know the the cocaine dealer used to come by the door at the office at well, on friday <laughs> afternoon starting at like two o'clock so there was this like wild wild like culture that i felt really really like distant from so i i did what i always do is i i found some allies um and i found a few uh like people who are really interested and and you know the other thing about vice is that there's multiple vices, right? Vice is very different now. Then I left in vice in 2016 or 2017 when, when I got the Netflix series. Um, but vice is very different now than it was then. And it was even very different when I showed up, there's the sort of salacious digital website part of vice. Um, you know, the first vice video I ever remember watching was about, you know, men who copulate with donkeys in Colombia. Yeah, That's just called complete, asses completely of the Caribbean. ridiculous yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, no, that was that was insane. So there was that vice. And then there was where I was, which was that I was at kind of the crown jewel, which was the HBO show. Um, and the the and and that was almost exclusively it was one of these rare places like current TV for a few years where it was just like, you know, what kind of story could you do? And Shane Smith, to his credit, is the founder of Vice like the culture there within my little small part of the organization, not speaking about vice culture writ large, was like, what's the wildest story you can do and how quick can you get out the door? And I think that's why vice had such an amazing ride for so long. I, I don't think that culture exists there anymore to be totally transparent. And I think that the product has declined and the market is certainly, you know, changed on vice. Yeah. Um, but for a brief moment, when Shane wanted, told me that he wanted to take on CNN for news. We had this small window of a couple of years where we could do anything as long as the story was like, was worth it. Um, yeah. And so that part 
really resonated with me. And the other thing is like, I didn't have to really participate in vice culture that much because I wasn't even there. I worked right. from home. I like was on the road half the time. So I could kind of, you know, take the parts that worked for me and then, you know, Avoid ignore the, the other parts. Yeah. Avoid the donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> well said. I mean, especially since you're a boat school guy, you know. <laughs> I had to get it in at least once. All right. Um, one of our members, Jeremy Cesar, I think is your last name, wants to ask a quick question. Hey, Kaj. Hey, thanks for your time. Thanks for your service. Congrats on all your uh, successes in, in your second career, first career, you know, of course, the same. Um, clearly, you've, you've got to a point in your career where you can choose some of those assignments that are, you know, I don't want to say sexy, but you can go to other continents and report on some of these conflicts. I'm a really recent retiree, even though the beard um, makes me not look like it. Any, any advice for starting out? Would you consider like, you know, domestic response to things like riots or hurricanes, floods, things like that, fires, or, or just any other kind of advice for somebody who's just trying to break in? Yeah, well, thank you for the question and uh, congrats on, on making the, the transition. Um, there's all other kinds of funny stuff we can talk about, about cultural differences between military and, and civilian world, especially in journalism. But I, I guess what I would say is that candidly, like when I first came out of the service and first got started in journalism, I didn't have the maturity to recognize how good some of that, some of the stuff you just described could be. Like I was going from being the tip of the spear and I even struggled with this from a, from like an ego perspective, right? I thought I went from being the man in the arena to the man covering the man in the arena. And it didn't feel nearly as sexy or nearly as like frontline vanguard as I thought. So I was constantly kind of pushing um, to do like the wildest, most outlandish thing that could be done. And I think in the process of keeping my vision like like that, that I probably missed a lot of like really low hanging fruit, but like really delicious fruit that was like right here domestically and in front of me. And as I've matured more and as I've done more stuff in media, what I realized is like, you, it doesn't have to be like, you know, always halo jumping into like a story in Pakistan to be a good story. I, what I wanted, what I've learned to do, hopefully, probably giving myself too much credit here, is transition from being bold in my actions to bold in my ideas. And I think there are plenty of like important, like I think there's a plethora of good ideas and, and stories that can happen, like just walking around the block, but it took me a long time to get to that level. So at, at a very practical level, um, the other thing, sorry, right before I get to the pragmatic thing, the other thing is it, it really depends where you are. Like one of the things that we're dealing with now, remember I started in journalism in 2005, YouTube had barely launched, if at all, wasn't a thing. Um, then like we were still dealing with old traditional media and I say old traditional media is pretty, if it's not dead, it's certainly, you it's know, having a, a death rattle. Yeah. Um, now the, the, the big thing is like, you know, we live in this attention economy, right? And so the, the real question is not like um, what story you're going to do um, or where you're going to do it even, but like, are, like, are you going to be able to capture people's attention and break through all of this white noise? And there are many ways to do that, to be excellent, best in class, uh, to be bold in your actions, to be bold in your ideas. But I do think that's the fundamental question because if you write a story or make a documentary in the forest and nobody hears it, like what's the point, right? Um, and so I think sometimes as journalists, uh, we get we 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 get so deep into the weeds on on whatever we're doing that we forget to ask this like fundamental why question. The fundamental why question it doesn't just improve your particular piece of content that you're working on, it, it forces you, it forces you to be better in how you get your product out into the world and in how you measure the success of your product. I ask most journalists, like what constitutes success? Is it clicks? Is it eyeballs? Is it, uh, you know, is it like an award, right? Like how do you measure success in this domain that we're in? I think is one of the fundamentally 
like most important, but like unasked questions by most yeah. journalists. And I would suggest that there are better ways for us to measure success for our work. Um, one example, right? Like I've been invited a couple of times to testify at, uh, in Congress at, uh, about certain issues and about certain um, issues that I've, I've been certain ideas that I've covered, right? There I am like talking about an issue like, you know, what's happening in sub-Saharan Africa in front of people who can actually move dollars and resources to impact those areas. So I, without being, you know, too pontifical about it, I do think one good thing to do is, is ask yourself how we measure the success of our efforts and be really open-minded. I, I can tell you how newsrooms do it. Newsrooms do it with chart beat and seeing which article is trending at top, right? Because that matters to their bottom line, but it, right. it doesn't matter to us in, in the same way. Yeah, no, that, that, that's good. Did, if I so, understand, yeah. well, I, I, was, I wanted to try to, to sort of smooth some of that out a little bit. Yeah. Practically, go after stories that are close to home. Go after stories that you see around you and cover them and cover them just as rigorously and just with, you know, with just as much drive as you would a bigger story, I think, is the first part of that. And then the second part, if, if I was understanding you right, was that success piece, avoiding the, the dollars and cents and the clicks, but being an expert, being a good enough journalist to be an expert on a topic when you're presenting it to folks that you can actually have an impact. Yes. Yeah. Impact. Right. I mean, I think if I'm going to, if I'm going to guess, like, I'll, like, look, if it's like Chapo said to Sean Penn, when Sean Penn did like an egregious piece of journalism, um, you know, I'm disparaging journalism by calling that article that he wrote journalism, but <laughs> it's like Chapo said to Sean Penn, like, I don't understand why you're in movies. Like the margins are so low, like you should be in oil or something. Right. Like, no, like, if, if we all cared about money, right? Like I'll get you guys all an internship at Goldman Sachs, right? Like, and we'll drive down that path. I think everybody is on this call because at some level they believe in the mission of journalism and they, they think it's important. So I would, I would stay close to that. And then to, 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 to build upon what you said, it's to build upon what you said, John, it's exactly right. In the ideation of your stories, what I would suggest is like, you know, it, it doesn't matter big or small, close or far, right? Like stories that are super compelling. Uh, and often you'll draw upon your own knowledge and experience to generate those ideas like I did with waterboarding or, or something like that, right? And don't, don't be afraid to lean into your military experience and your life experience to, to ideate and generate those. Um, in the execution of those stories, big or small, exactly what you said, like full force vigor um, going in, um, and, and also be conscious as you pursue those stories, uh, what is the distribution outlet that you're gonna use? How are you gonna break through the white noise uh, and, and be a viable player in this attention economy and get your product seen or read or, or whatever, right? And then finally, like to keep in mind the bigger picture question of, of, of why. What is, what is the value to my reader and audience? Um, what do I expect? What do I expect to change as a result? of this work that I just did? Or what do I expect to happen as a consequence? What is the impact of my work? Um, and I think if, if you follow that template for, for stories, you're, you're really, you're far and above a lot of journalists with like either far more experience or like far more sort of formal credentialization. Nice. Well, Kaj, we've monopolized your time for about an hour and I am extremely grateful. I know we've already gotten a couple messages from the folks in this call thanking you for going full circle with us on your journalism. Uh, I know that you obviously have a passion for supporting veterans and that comes across really, really plainly. And you obviously have a passion for journalism. And again, that comes across very, very strong. So just thank you for joining us. Uh, like I said earlier, we're gonna throw this up on our YouTube channel to try to make it available to more of our veterans, hopefully do exactly what we were just talking about, reach out to some more people and, and actually see that, that impact a little bit better. And that, dude, thank you so much. That's awesome. Thank you, John. And thank you everybody else for joining. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your questions. Uh, I really appreciate, appreciate 
that anybody wants to to take their Thursday afternoon and, and listen to my, you know, uh, nonlinear career path. Uh, I hope you got something valuable out of it. Uh, but if there's anything I can do to be more helpful to the MG MVJ family and community, like please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm I'm easily findable on all the all the things, all the socials and all that stuff. Awesome. Thanks, Cash.